Well, greetings, Westlife. Uh, it's been a great uh, equip time so far. Um, I'm, I'm, and I get to uh, dive now into uh, a little bit more of a deeper, like, how conversation of, like, community and particularly civility and relationships in a time where we're so divided as society. So, uh, so great to have you join us. I'm here uh, with my good friend, uh, uh, Dr. Kevin Glenn. Kevin and I, uh, we've got a lot of common. Uh, many of you don't know, we're, uh, maybe Kevin doesn't even know this. We're both drummers. We're both semioticians, uh, which means we both did our doctorate together. We That's how we know each other. We went to school together. Uh, but, you know, Kevin uh, is in the States, so he is uh, south side. So I was explaining to him in the break what ketchup chips were because he had no idea. He thought like it was like, you know, fries and ketchup. Uh, so I did, you know, we like a little bit of a cultural explanation. But uh, Kevin is joining us from uh, Jackson, Tennessee, where he serves at his church as, uh, as lead pastor, and Kevin is the author of this great book. Uh, pastor Ryan referred to it either. It's called Hand Over Fist. You can purchase it on Amazon. You can get it on Indigo, which is a Canadian uh, retailer, or you can get, we have a couple copies here at church. There'll be one even in the library, all on this topic that we're going to dive into today. So uh, uh, welcome, Kevin. It's great to have you join us. Uh, why don't you uh, say hi, maybe give Thank us you. maybe a little bit of comments, maybe explain to us as you were saying earlier, how you could be all about civility and love <laughs> kickboxing and be a kickboxer. I know, right? <laughs> oh, well, hello, uh, Westlife. Thank you so much for uh, letting me come and, and hang out with you today. It's, uh, it is it is a, a gray, rainy, dreary day here in Jackson, Tennessee. So uh, I don't know what it's like up there, but yeah, it's just so wet here right now. So it's nice to be inside, dry, talking to you, Bryce, and talking to everybody. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a walking contradiction, and that's just one of them. That, you know, I wrote a book on civility, and I love kickboxing, but it, it, it's for the fitness aspect. I, sure. I, you know, really. Sure. It, it, you know, it's like Jedi. Jedi use only use their skills for, for, uh, for self-defense. Yeah. That's what it is. So, yeah, it's all that. Very, very good. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, so good. Well, Kevin, let's, let's jump into this. So you wrote this book Thank called you. Hand Over Fist. Uh, wow. what, what led you to write it, and, uh, you know, why is this such a passion? passion for you of, of Christ-centered civility? Yeah, well, a lot of it is because I, I grew up in the church uh, in he, here in the United States and just became very much aware as I was uh, uh, as uh, I, I was in churches as a, as a youth and family minister and then later on as a lead pastor. And it seemed like issue after issue, whether it was preaching styles and debates over preaching styles, debates over theology, Calvinism, Arminianism, and all of that, uh, the worship wars, uh, should music be traditional, uh, contemporary, modern, whatever. And, and I noticed both growing up and then um, when I was on church staff that uh, within the body of Christ, yeah. we didn't really seem to be handling those conflicts very well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would be in, in church business meetings where hymnals would fly oh, wow. uh, over, over things like that. And, and I just thought, now, like now, now, physically wait a fly, physically fly. Yeah. You wow. know, wow. Um, it's full, you know, and that's, that's where the kickboxing would come in handy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, had to had to knock those things out of the That's way. Awesome. Fortunately, they they were never throwing them at me. But it's just something that I yeah. that I saw, and I think some of it, uh, uh, as, as a kid, just I knew something wasn't right, but I really didn't have much of a context for it. And then as I as I got older, uh, I did my undergraduate work in psychology and counseling, and then all of that. So in, in a nutshell, as I watched uh, conflict within the church uh, mirror conflict outside of the church. Yeah. Basically, my my brothers and sisters in Christ were f basically fighting according to the same ugly rules hmm. as the world outside. And so I became extremely concerned about the internal unity of the body of Christ yeah. and the external witness that that are so that good. that you know that we weren't doing a good job and that was splitting us up in the church, weakening 
um, our internal strength yeah. and uh, doing great damage to our external witness as you know we're supposed to be in the world and not of it and sure. yet very little if any difference between the way that Christians would resolve their conflicts with one another uh, and very little difference between that and anything that you would see um, any other person in a relationship yeah. doing there was just no difference this kind yeah. of came to a head for me during the 2012 presidential election in the sure. United States. Sure. And and so that was the really was the 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 the, the force that said, OK, I got I got to write about this. I got to yeah. put something out um, uh, so that we can I can do more than just say, hey, I don't like that. What's going to be my contribution to yeah. try to provide some ways to hopefully overcome this. Yeah, it's so good. It's so it's so fascinating, right? Where Jesus said you're supposed to know, like everyone's supposed to know we're his disciples by our love. And yet yeah. you there would be real, like unfortunately, largely if you look at the the large, the kind of the larger uh, C church particularly, there really isn't a whole lot of difference in how we uh, deal with each other. You go to any denominational meeting, large, small denominations, there's like fight and anger. It's, it's there's hymnals, like you say, flying across the rooms. <laughs> If not like doctrinal statements, etc., it's it's right. it's one of those things that like there's there's got to be a better way. So that's why I love your book. In fact, I love the image of your book, the idea of yeah. hand over fist. Like, where did that come from, Kevin? Well, and and yeah, I I grew up um, I, I grew up hearing the term hand over yeah. fist because people would say, oh, they're making money hand over fist. Well, I, like okay, this isn't a book about making money. Uh, so, but what is it? And really, it came to me when I was reading uh, some work by Bob Goff, mm. um, who's you know kind of a famous writer, author. Yeah. Uh, and everything. And you just became but, Pastor Quinn's best friend, just a heads up. Okay. Pastor, hey, that's Pastor Quinn loves Bob Goff. <laughs> yeah. And so in Bob Goff's book, Love Does, he talks about uh, this this practice of having your your hands open and your palms mm. up uh, kind of under the under the table, kind of laying on your knees whenever you're in a, a conflicting conversation. And there's some there's a connection yeah. between the, the practice of having your palms open and your palms up rather than what we typically do whenever we become conflicted and clinch our fists. Mm. Um, and Bob Goff challenged people to do that. Well, I took that challenge up and it really, really works. It helps keep you composed, um, under control and things like that. So it was that practice. And then it was also a statement or a quote that Bob Goff, uh, made. And, and I may not get this exactly right, but he said something to the effect that I used to think that having clenched fists made me stronger. Hmm. Uh, but really it was an open hand that made me stronger. Oh, yeah. And so I thought, wow. And so, yeah, the image is, when, when, when this tends to be the posture of, of everybody uh, and even the, the posture that is most valued, hmm. um, a posture of an open hand, uh, it, it inviting, somewhat vulnerable, it's yeah. reaching across, reaching toward, taking a step toward. Um, it's everything that I think uh, Jesus did for us um, and how we're to model that toward each other. And so it's yeah. us taking the initiative to open, keep ourselves open to the, to the conversations that matter. Excellent. Yeah, I, like it just it's a really great dovetail into our first session, which was all about like you, in our ind super individualistic society where we have a tendency to all be about ourselves. You can be closed fists all the time, but that's actually not God's desire. We actually don't live be life best that way. And you can't hold somebody's hand if you're like having your fish clenched, all, fist clenched all the time. So just a good reminder of like even that to experience what we talked about, what, what Pastor Matt talked about earlier to do that, then we got to find a way to open our hands. And that's, I yeah. think, part of what you communicate, this idea of civility. So maybe let's yeah. start by talking a little bit about that. So let's sure. talk, maybe if you want to define civility and incivility, like what's what's the difference? So we're all using the same terms as we look here. Right. And it's interesting because in, in, in the book, I spend a lot of time defining civility by talking about what civility isn't. Yes. And, uh, you know, I'm working on I'm working on a revised and updated edition, and I want to spend a little more time defining what it is. Uh, but for, for our purposes here, civility really is uh, a, a set of values, a set of practices, a mindset, an attitude, and an intentional commitment hmm. on, on my part that when I'm in interaction with another person, uh, I, am, I am going to see them. And I'm going to let them know that they're being seen, uh, not from a place of superiority, but, you know, I see you. Yeah. I hear you. 
uh, it's it's basically civility is really the 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 art and practice of of valuing that other person and treating them with the dignity that is theirs by being a fellow image bearer of God. Hmm. And and because even if I vehemently disagree with them and sure. find their ideas to be detestable and abhorrent, um, there's a person there. And I want to interact with the person and work through and allow, allow the dignity of the person and their value in being heard and in being seen to inform how we navigate the issues and how I, I listen to them and hear them uh, so that I can uh, best understand where they're coming from mm. and really how they got there. Mm. That's part of it is, is civility is part of it is being interested in the journey of how did they get to yeah. where they are today? How do they arrive there? And so civility is kind of this, this conglomeration of attitudes and practices that keep us engaged, keep us seeing, keep us hearing, keep us listening and keep us curious, all yeah. uh, informed by the dignity uh, of that that's other good. person. Oh, that's great. And I, and I, one of the things that you touch on in your book, which I think is such a great uh, a distinction here, is you talk about the danger of politeness, or I would say the like, yeah. the, the, the embrace of a counterfeit kindness of embracing mm -hmm. niceness instead, right? Like we, we think like we just probably like be polite or nice. And that's what, what you're talking about with, with civility. And you would actually argue against that kind of explain that. So even, even as we dive into like, well, how then do we live with civil with one another? Let's maybe explain, let's not accept the counterfeit that too many people accept, which is politeness or niceness. Right. Politeness or niceness, and they do, they sound good at the beginning. Um, I grew up in the deep South. Uh, I still live in the deep South here in Jackson, Tennessee. Um, uh, I don't talk like a lot of the other people who uh, I've been town with here. <laughs> their, uh, their Southern sure. drawl is quite a bit more than mine, but, uh, but I grew up in, in central Florida and in the, in the Southern United States, there was this politeness culture that I was really raised with. And it was the idea that that, well, we don't talk about such things or we don't talk to certain people because it's not part of polite society. Hmm. And so uh, politeness was really seen as a, uh, as a non-confrontational way to assert your superiority over someone or, the, or to somehow communicate their inferiority to you. And politeness and niceness at their essence are not, they're not honest. It's, it's sure. dishonest. And so really civility is not being nice. Now incivility is being mean and sure. being ugly and being hateful, but being civil does not take away the reality of being firm hmm. uh, and, and being clear and having convictions. So being polite, being nice means uh, a couple of different things. One that that I'm not going to I'm not going to be honest with you sure. about my disagreement or my hesitancy with something, and it's easier then just to use politeness or niceness to keep a distance between us hmm. to avoid talking about the conversation or to avoid talking about the issue, and then just keep myself around a group of people who already agree with me. And that's niceness and politeness. Sure. They're not honest. They're not engaging. And another facet of that is what um, uh, kind of opponents of civility would call being tone police. Okay. And it's saying, well, it's a, there's a firm tone, and, and so you're not being civil, so we're not going to continue the conversation. And it's it's policing people's tone, and it it becomes kind of a form of cancel culture and censorship. Sure. Uh, we'll, we'll, we're just not going to let you talk. Hmm. Uh, we're just not going to let, but I think the, t the, the robust part of civility is that if you and I are talking Bryce, or I'm talking with someone and our ideas are at odds with one another, there's conflict. Um, what am I doing whenever I take the time and do the work of really listening to you really trying to get at hmm. what what is the source of this conflict um, and and taking the time to explain and formulate 
why we're not on the same page, yeah. why I don't agree with that. When I do those things, I'm honoring you. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm saying you matter and this idea matters enough that I'm going to hang in here and rather than take the easy way out and just vilify you, dehumanize you, label you, call you a name, say, well, you're part of that other party over there or do something to, to, to distance and to uh, stop the conversation or just say, oh, you know, I just want to be nice and, and, and avoid the whole thing. All of those are forms of uh, um, uh, ways that we really kind of kind of devalue one another and de- and dishonor one another. Sure. So niceness, polite, politeness does that. Um, and, and they're more sinister cousins, uh, canceling and censor- censorship. Sure. That. Well, one of the things like this is part of the cultural dynamic, right? You talk about like a politeness that's south of the border. As Canadians, right. we're known to be polite. I remember when yes. we were hanging out together <laughs> and you guys all made fun of me because I kept apologizing all the time as a Canadian with all my American friends. So like, stop apologizing. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm sorry. So you're doing it again. And as Canadians, uh, this actually can be a bit of our challenge. So sometimes we're so polite that actually we we embrace a counterfeit civility and assume we're actually expressing community or relationship or unity when actually it's it's not that at all we've just accepted a niceness and uh instead of where like kindness and and true community and being honest with one another is actually what christ calls us to that's a christ-centered civility so this is this is great so as we think about this then as we kind of walk through well what does that look like how do then i uh how do we uh, kind of embrace this this vision then of true community and 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 Christ-centered civility with each other? Um, how do we do that? Like, what are some tips? Uh, I think in yeah. your book you use an acronym of civil. There's different things that you've yeah. you've addressed. Like, like walk us through like the how we do civil with one another. Yeah, I think one of the most important. Uh, attitudes that we can take on and postures that we can take is one that um, uh, I, I, I didn't come up with this. Richard Mao, the former president of Fuller's Theological Seminary, came up with this uh, idea called cognitive modesty. And cognitive modesty means that I, I enter disagreements or I enter um, conversations where I don't understand the perspective of another person, or Mm -hmm. even if I do know that I disagree, but I enter that from a place of being a student, Mm -hmm. not being an expert, uh, not being there to prove anyone right, but with the idea that I'm here to understand. I'm here to try my best to understand where, where they're coming from, how they got there. And cognitive modesty simply means that I'm coming in saying, okay, based on what I understand and what I think I know at this point, here's what I think I hear you saying. And being open to being corrected that no, that's of that, you know what, maybe I don't understand hmm. or I didn't have their ideas right. Um, but taking that time uh, and, and kind of putting myself in the posture of help me understand. I'm asking them to help me understand. How did we get here? If it's a relational conflict, um, what is it that, what's my contribution here? Mm. What's my contribution to this? So it's, it's maintaining uh, a, a posture of curiosity. Good. Um, uh, curiosity is huge. You know, okay, so... So again, and my favorite question is help me understand, really help me understand yeah. this. How did, uh, with this idea that you've arrived at, how did you get from, from, from there to here and being willing to, to, to walk through that? So it's that cognitive modesty, it's maintaining that curiosity, it's um, refusing to vilify the other person, refusing to do that. Um, there's uh, there, there's a young lady, and I, I don't have her name in front of me now, but she wrote a book um, after mine came out uh, called Mere Civility. Mm. And she actually has a TED Talk where she talks about uh, some of this. But, but she said civility is necessary, especially for those conversations with people that we might have the most trouble respecting. Mm. Uh, and it, it gives us a mechanism 
to, to say, I am not going to shut this conversation down by making a villain out of you. Yeah. I, I'm, I may find the ideas absolutely ridiculous, yeah. but I need this curiosity and I need this uh, posture and process of listening and hearing and seeing and understanding so that, uh, so that there is an opportunity for us to continue in some kind of relationship moving forward uh, for this conversation to continue. I think, I, so it's, sorry, sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I was going to say, like, I think uh, the, that, that kind of the, the villain thing is the thing yeah. I probably see the most right now because everybody is at the edge. Like, they're all, like, at least in Canadian context, we're in the midst of a federal mm -hmm. election. Um, so, like, all of those conversations are happening. We're in the midst of, at least in our province, like an emergency, uh, emergency orders around COVID, and there's different yeah. views around that and vaccine passports. Those are all the hot topics that we're all about. And, and even in the church, they're hot topics, right? And mm -hmm. it's so easy. Like it's the it's the easy road, and we want easy right now because we most people yeah. don't have time or the emotional bandwidth for complex. I think the temptation towards the vilification is so so important. So like like maybe say a little bit yeah. more about that. So like how do we sure. break out of that villain mindset? Like there's the the, the curiosity part for sure. Um, is mm -hmm. there anything else? Any other tools we can <laughs> we can put in the tool belt to break out of that? that temptation towards vilifying people who are different than us? Yeah, I, I think you have to constantly remind yourself that you wouldn't want someone assuming the worst about you. Good, yeah. Uh, and I don't want someone considering me the villain because I really don't think of myself as a villain. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to be a villain. I, I, I don't think any of us got up this morning on our way to Westlife and said, dang it, I'm going to be a villain today. You know, I am, yeah. I am all in it for the villain and no, no one does that. So if I don't want that assumed on me, then I carry that into the conversation that, you know what, I'm not going to take the easy route and I'm not so going to assign this label to another person. Um, I, I have, I, I'm going to go at this uh, with the assumption yeah. that they didn't get up this morning, wanted to be a villain <laughs> and they're trying to come up with ideas for the same issue that I'm concerned about. And sure. they, they have come to different conclusions. There may be a lot of reasons for that. And those are the reasons I want to try to understand. Yeah. So I don't want to, so I think the tip would be don't settle for the quick, easy label. Yeah. Um, because you don't want that assigned to you because you would say, no, I'm not a villain. There's, sure. there's a reason why I think this, and I know that you're not going to like maybe this part of the idea, but here's how I got here. Mm. There's, there's always more, uh, it's always more complex. And I think that's part of it is we vilify in an attempt to oversimplify. Do, do and you, do you think maybe a part, oh, do you think maybe part of the villain nature is we, uh, we 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 create a villain out of somebody who just has rearranged values than we do, right? Yeah. So like you know somebody else values uh, you know freedom. Some people value uh, like um, uh, kind of the, a, a collective response to something. Like we're all going to gather together, and, and both groups probably in the end, so yeah, collective responses are good. Yes, freedoms are good. Mm -hmm. One person's just trumping that value. Value. It's just a value realignment. Yet we all yeah. have similar values. So maybe part of that's a way to like, I want to honor you and the value you hold on freedom or the value you hold on collective responsibility. Um, but I just rearrange those values that we would both agree yeah. on to just to try to find some middle ground that they're not an evil person that 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 is is doing something we would completely dis disagree with in a completely different way but it's the rearrangement of values as opposed to being a villain yeah and i think you i, I know that we want it fast i I, sure. I know that i get that i am the most impatient person uh i have been praying for patience and God continues to procrastinate. So I don't get that. <laughs> That's but, a good uh, yeah, <laughs> but, um, I think you have to make the effort and take the time to try to find that place on which you mm. and the other person have some common ground. That's good. And, uh, because when you find the common ground and try to work from how to work out from there. And I think we start out over here. Uh, we, we started on in these polarities mm. And sometimes when you, when you take the time to, to try to find the place, take COVID for instance, 
Um, nobody likes that COVID is here. Sure. Nobody yeah. is celebrating the arrival of COVID. Yeah. All of us are, what, what can be done about this terrible thing? What can we do to protect one another? And you know, the political realm is kind of the way that is kind of the, the arena in which a lot of these conversations are taking place. And I love what Michael Ware, uh, Michael Ware is an author and someone here in the States that was part of, uh, part of uh, President Obama's uh, staff um, back, back in the day. He was, I think, Office of Faith Affairs or something, but he's a friend. And uh, I like, he says, he says, politics is that area where we are seeking to try to know how to be good neighbors. Hmm. Um, and, and in, so in that realm, even trying to find where, what we have in common, what the value is that we both can agree on and working out from there. Um, and that, that takes time. It takes the curiosity. It takes the commitment to cognitive modesty. It takes the refusal to vilify. Um, I, w I wish it could happen. I really do. Yeah. Um, haven't seen that yet. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, the kingdom of God is best expressed in slowness. It is. And that's it always is. a part of the challenge. So I got, we have a question yeah. from somebody. I want to make sure you have time for this. So sure. here's a question for us, uh, Kevin. We live in a day where views on the pandemic and polarized politics is often topic of conversation. We've been talking about that. Rather than avoiding the topics, which we all have a tendency to do, what are some yeah. guidelines for engaging in these conversations? We've talked about you know uh, ways to kind of maybe make that positive, but what are some guidelines yeah. to engage these conversations? Yeah, I think some guidelines would be would kind of be that that um, that civil framework that, that, that I use, and uh, it, it's kind of a, an acrostic and or acronym, and it's it's something that I still use. Uh, but civil is clarity, uh, and and it's what are we talking about really? Uh, it's it's getting down to uh, if we're going to talk about the pandemic, we're going to talk about um, you know ways that that we want to. Uh, make things better or have solutions, masks, no mask, all that. Um, clarity is so important because it's so easy to chase a rabbit, uh, so easy to go down a rabbit hole. Mm. And how many of us have been in an argument with our spouse or with a friend and 10 minutes into it, we stop and we go, wait a minute, what are we arguing about again? You know, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and so clarity Facts. is just, yeah, clarity is just determining, okay, so what, what are we really going to talk about here? Very what, good. uh, what, what is the topic? Um, intent is what is our goal? Is our goal to, un to better understand uh, each other and, and how we got to where we are? So good, is yeah. the goal, yeah, is the goal to solve this thing? I think sometimes we go into conversations seeking solutions, uh, seeking the how yeah. before we've understood another person's why and what. So and good. the problem is how will eat why for breakfast, hmm. you know, always it will. Uh, so what we need to know, okay, why do you want a mask mandate or why do you have this particular idea? What's the why behind that? Okay. What, uh, what is being done to carry that, carry that out? What's the motivation and then so how can we work together? Well, sometimes we're, we're trying to have a conversation about the how, we don't even understand the why. So the intent of the conversation is what is our goal? Our goal is to get to the why. I wanna understand your why, your motivation. Okay, then let's set reasonable goals there. Sometimes our goals, we just, we, we've bitten off more than we can chew in that, in that interaction. Uh, so in, intention. V is value where uh, we're sitting, we're sitting down, we're talking about an issue. And this is again, where I, I am, I'm deliberately going to see you intentionally going to see you as someone who is concerned about this issue like I am. And I'm going to assume that, that, uh, that motive on your part and that value, I'm going to hear you. I'm going to see you. And okay. I'm, I'm, going to go in in good faith that you're going to hear and see me hmm. because what you think is valuable and it's valuable enough that we're going to have the, you know, get, do the work of having this conversation. Hmm. Um, interaction is, is where, how, how do these issues interact with one another? Is this, and, and this is a huge one. Is this a problem to be solved or is this a tension to be managed? Hmm. Uh, I think sometimes we are trying to, 
we are trying to solve tensions. And sometimes the ideas that we have that we're arguing over are not opposed to one another, but they're interdependent on one another. And it's like a suspension bridge. If one side of the suspension bridge wins, the bridge collapses. Yeah. There, there might be some issues. There might be some things we're talking about in relationships or marriage or church or whatever, where my side and your side are actually dependent on one another. And we have to work through how do we manage that tension? Because it's never going to be a problem that's solved. Hmm. Uh, so what's the best way to walk through the tension? And then limits, uh, the L in civil limits are, um, what are, what are going to be, how far are we going to go? Uh, if, if there comes a point in the conversation where we begin to fall apart and start calling one another names or things like that, okay, time out. Um, what are the boundaries going to be? Boundaries are very, very healthy things to mm. set. And what are our boundaries going to be? Um, what are our time limits going to be? What, uh, you know, it's just establishing, if we're going to establish a framework, we also have to establish how far we're going to go and no further. And that can be, and if, if someone is, tends to have an explosive temper um, or use abusive language, that, okay, that's not good. We're not going to tolerate that. Or we have 15 minutes to discuss this. <laughs> Let's set a goal for what we can really hope to accomplish in 15 mm. minutes. And so a lot of it is having that plan, beginning with the end in mind, as uh, Stephen Covey used to say. And I think to, to the extent now, it's crazy at first, it's hard to do at first, but what I've learned over the years is this starts to become an, uh, this starts to become a skill set that you find yourself plugging in automatically when you go into different sorts of, of uh, conversations and it, it, it becomes more natural. But it's a skill set that you learn and plug in um, as you go. So I hope that helps. Well, that, that, this is excellent, Kevin. I think this maybe help some people, uh, myself included, have a much better holiday with their families. Uh, they're my, they're, <laughs> like, this is super practical for us to think about how actually do we coexist with people who are radically different than us. So uh, Westlife, yeah. uh, I, I'd encourage you to grow, uh, go grab uh, Kevin's book, uh, Hand Over Fist. It's filled with practical stuff. All the stuff we've been talking about is, is spoken more detail here. Again, it's in the Ridge Cafe. You can get it on all the online platforms. Um, Kevin, so great to have you join us at our Equip Weekend. This is so so good to give us some things to grab a hold of as we try to embrace and express Christ-centered, robust civility and not sent, uh, not like uh, a settle for a counterfeit version of it in our Canadian politeness and niceness when God calls us to something much more beautiful and much more robust. So Westlife, I'd encourage you to join us tomorrow for our Sunday service as we look uh, in a deeper way at what does it look like for us to embrace this in a practical way as a church? How do we come alongside and restore relationships? And we're going to actually come to the communion table together. So I'd encourage you to prepare your hearts as we come, as diverse as we are as a church, to the most beautiful, miraculous thing that we do together, which is to remember the death, the resurrection of Jesus that actually brings us close together as one another and allows us in a Christ-centered way to be civil with one another and to be in community with us, in with each other in the diverse that we have. So join us tomorrow at 9 and 11 o'clock in person and online. So great to have you join us at our Equip Weekend. And again, thanks, uh, Dr. Glenn, for joining with us. And I uh, look forward to uh, all that God will teach us and challenge us as we put this into practice. God bless you, Westlife. We'll see you soon. Thank you.